Morning Facebook, how are we? It's been a long time since I did a morning, early morning Facebook Live. And the main reason for that is just just been super busy um, building a business. And so actually I've not really been in the office a huge amount. Um, I've been out doing deals and all sorts of stuff. So um, I've missed you guys. Now the reason or the um, uh, the reason I'm in the office early this morning is because I am getting ready for next week, which is our three day boot camp. I've got some slides to do. I've got some um, content to send off to the printers for the workbooks and all these sorts of things. So I'm in this morning. I've been up since five um, and I am. Um, I thought I'd do a quick, I'm having a little lem sip break actually. It's not even coffee this morning, it's lem sip because I don't know if you can hear my voice is shit. But the reason for my video this morning is a follow on from my business partner Justin's video that he did yesterday. And for those of you that haven't seen it, I did share it into this group. I shared it onto the Rent to Rent group as well, but you can look him up, Justin Whittemore. Um, and it's on there. Um, the, the, con the context of his video, for those of you who didn't see it, the context of his video is basically that he's been working with a person over the last couple of days who's been in to see us for training. And <coughs> unfortunately, this person has purchased a sourced uh, serviced accommodation deal through a sourcer. Now, first of all, the sourcers charged him a fee for a deal that doesn't stack, when you do the numbers on it, actually it loses money every month. But the second really, really, really bad part of this particular deal is that um, the sourcer that sold it to the operator has lied to the, the letting agent that they've taken the deal through and told them that it's something completely different. And so the operator has signed the contract, started to set up the service department, bought the furniture, advertised it, taken bookings, and the agent is now saying, well, you can't use it for this purpose. And we've never been told anything about this. We've not got permissions. We've not got this. Now, there is a degree of responsibility on any investor, any operator buying a deal from a source. Store. There's a degree of responsibility on you to do your due diligence. Right. So it's important that you know what to ask, what questions to ask so that you can actually make sure you're making the right choice when it comes to actually selecting a deal. Um, so I really wanted to just do a quick video this morning to help you um, to just give you a bit of a few tips really on how you can identify the shit sources from the decent sources and the sorts of questions you can be asking if you're looking at buying a deal. Now, obviously, I, I teach people how to become self-sufficient, how to source their own deals. But one of the other things when you learn how to source is you actually learn how to identify a good deal from a bad deal. You might decide to learn and then not actually do it yourself. You might decide to work with a partner like me, a sourcing agent, but you'll be able to identify the deal that stacks versus a deal that doesn't stack. And you'll certainly be able to ask the right questions to be able to know whether or not you've got consent to let the building in the way that you're planning to do for your business plan, right? So that service accommodation, that is for you to be able to do short stay lets in it. If it's for a HMO, you need to get the license on it. There's all these different things to consider. So I really wanted to just kind of run through a couple of things and a couple of ways that you guys can identify um, the good from the bad. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry for the coffin. Let's see who's online anyway this morning before I jump into this. Ruta, good morning. Liam, hey. Mark, I need to talk to you today. Um, Danny, Joe, hello, 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 Stella, hello, hello. How are we all? Are we doing good? I can see Lee's on here as well. Good morning, guys. So first of all, so the, the key things that I think you guys need to know about, okay, is, and I kind of bang the drum about for this quite a lot, is the compliance side of things. So when you are um, starting a relationship with a sourcer, so let's say you decide that you want to buy a deal. You want to buy a service accommodation deal. Let's just use that as an example, okay? This applies for all deals, by the way, but let's just use service accommodation as an example. If you contact me as an investor looking to sign up to our investor list and looking to buy a deal from me, then what I would recommend that you do with all sources as the investor is to ask them a few questions to start off with, okay? And the key questions are, how much experience have you got? OK, now I want to just little caveat to that. It doesn't actually matter if a source has only been doing it for six months or seven months or eight months or nine months or three months even or even a day. You know, if they're good and they're following the right system and they're following the right process and they're doing things in the right way, actually, 
that source is going to be worth more to you than a source that's been doing it 10 years, but it's been doing a really poor job ripping people off. So don't be, um, don't feel like you have to discount people because they don't have loads of years of experience. Because let's be honest, I've only got three years experience. And actually, I know that every investor that I've ever sold a deal to has been delighted. So um, and has made more money than I predicted that they would. So, you know, the experience thing is not necessarily a deal breaker, but it's good to ask a question. You can then move on to asking questions like, where did you get trained? What training have you had? What, you know, what training are you planning? Are you in a mentorship? Have you got any support? Is there anyone checking your deals for you? You know, these sorts of things are really helpful for you to understand. By all means, work with new sources. What's great is when you can find a sourcer that's in a really solid mentorship with somebody that's great because their deals are being checked by somebody. So you've inadvertently got access to the, the more senior, more level uh, experience level without really having to do that. You've just got access to the, the new person. So what sort of experience have you got? What sort of training have you done? The second thing that I think is really important to ask is about the compliance side of things. OK, now for you to for a, for a sourcing agent to be allowed to trade, there are four key things. Now, there are a few other bits and pieces, but there's a highlighted four key things. Now, Tina Walsh wrote the book on this. So if you haven't read the book already, I recommend that you buy Tina Walsh's book. It's called Property Sourcing Compliance. You can get it on Amazon. Um, and in the book, it explains all of this. So I'm just going to summarize it. I can't explain it as well as Tina did because she's my compliance advisor. Um, she's the expert. I, I just know what she's taught me to, to do in my business. So I'm going to share that with you. So the first thing is professional indemnity insurance. OK, professional indemnity insurance is an insurance that you will have as a sourcer or your sourcer will have as a sourcer um, to protect them if they make a mistake. OK, now that means, you know, they might, for example, mislead somebody inadvertently you know sometimes people say the wrong thing sometimes people don't understand what they're doing like the way that they're crunching the numbers sometimes people just look at the wrong information online when they're doing the comparables you know it happens people we you know there's a human error aspect to what we do we're only human after all nobody's perfect so the insurance is there to protect you as the investor so if you're buying a deal from a sourcer what you want to want one of the first questions you want to ask them is what professional indemnity insurance do you have that protects me, the investor, if this deal decide, if this deal falls to, falls apart in, because you, the information you've given me isn't accurate or because it all goes, you know, tits up? If they don't have professional indemnity insurance, that should be your first reg flag. If they can't answer the question of what professional indemnity insurance they have, then that should be another red flag for you. If they don't, if they're not able to provide you with like a copy of their certificate. That says that they're insured again that's a red flag you know if you if you sign up with me and we're going to sell you a deal if you ask me for that information i'll happily share it with you because actually that proves that i've got fit for purpose professional indemnity insurance and actually that protects my investor because if anything does go wrong and let's be honest things go wrong then that investor's protected they've got some kind of point of escalation that they can go to to reclaim their funds basically so if you're buying a deal from a sourcer and they don't have fit for purpose broking insurance then that should be a massive red flag you definitely don't want to be working with those sources now some sources unfortunately have been on training that Ne that never teach compliance they don't mention it in a lot of the training courses which is an absolute disgrace in my opinion but you know people do what they do your job as an investor actually in some cases will be to educate them and say well hold on if you've not got professional indemnity insurance i really like this deal but i can't buy the deal unless you you're compliant so go away and get compliant and then i'll buy the deal you've got that position as an investor you've got that confidence you should have that confidence to be able to say that to your sourcing agent because it is a partnership and it needs to work for you both right so and um, does that make sense to everybody before i jump on to the next thing give me just some likes and hearts if this is making sense or some comments so that i know that we're um we're making sense good morning lewis how are you good morning jd how are you jd where's your check-in today i haven't seen it yet get me your check-in um kudrat hello how are you this morning great to hear from you are we is this making sense to everybody right okay good so the second thing is 
again it's compliance linked but it's a really good way of you filtering out the the, the wheat from the chaff let's say is to ask a question around um the ombudsman which ombudsman are they a member of which ombudsman service so there's there's two key ones one is the property ombudsman and the other is the property redress scheme so tpo or prs is how you generally hear us refer to it in the industry the property ombudsman has been around the longest um, PRS is a newer one but they're both very very good they're both a little bit different but ultimately an ombudsman is there so that if a deal falls to pieces if a relationship falls to pieces and you can't resolve the solution between you and the sourcer so you as the investor can't find the solution for the sourcer that works for you both then the escalation point is the ombudsman so it's the same as if you like fall out with British Gas or you fall out with the bank or whatever it might be if you're not happy with their in-house resolution for your complaint you have to go through the company um, complaint process if you're not happy with their in-house resolution and you can escalate it to the ombudsman and the ombudsman basically is there to finalize a decision so they're there to say actually we believe that you as the investor have been treated unfairly and we believe you're uh, entitled to xyz or they might say actually you as the source have been treated unfairly and you're entitled to xyz but whatever way around it is the ombudsman's decision is final it is kind of the stopping point if the problem we have is if your sourcer is not a member of an ombudsman then again you as the investor have absolutely no control or protection to escalate any kind of conflict, which means basically that saucer can just disappear off the planet, never speak to you again, keep your money, and you're left stuck. Now, I've got at least eight clients that I can tell that I know of right now who have paid money to certain sourcing companies that have kind of popped up over the last couple of years. Now, the sourcing agencies that actually ask for money up front before they even show you a deal. I'll get onto that in a second, but you know, these guys are paying money and then the deal disappears for whatever reason it falls out or it, you know, it's pulled or it's sold to somebody else or whatever. And then the age, the sourcing agent keeps their money on account until another deal comes along. It's mental. Never be putting money in up front. Let I'm jumping. I'll come back to that one in a second. So back to the, the ombudsman. So the ombudsman, if your um, sourcing agent is not a member of an ombudsman, then you've got no escalation point. So when something like that happens, when there's someone who's holding your money or, you know, a deal falls out or you really genuinely can see that you've been misled because um, in like in the case that Justin was talking about in the video yesterday, the sourcing agents actually lied to the agent and the landlord of the building and told them it's going to be used for something completely different. That's negligence. Okay, so that would actually then be... A, if it, you know the client that Justin was working with can't get if they can't get a resolution from the sourcing agent themselves then if that agent if that sourcing agent is not a member of a TPO then there's no escalation point so that client is not going to be able to escalate that and get a resolution if they are a member of an ombudsman then you as the investor have got that next step that you can jump up to say well hold on I'm not happy with this resolution I really need it to be dealt with at a more senior level that's why you need to ask and push back as an investor and say, I want to see evidence of what ombudsman you're in. If you don't do that as an investor, if you don't check these things, then you know you're, you open yourself up to being to, at risk of losing your money, which is not really what we want, right? We work hard for our money, keep it protected. So there are two, first of all, right? Your insurance and your ombudsman that's really important to protect you as the investor now the other key things about um compliance when it comes to sourcing is for a sourcing agent to be compliant and what's what i'm tending to see is a bit of a trend the agents the sourcing agents that go to the effort of becoming fully compliant tend not to be taking the piss out of people it's the people that set up in a moment's notice and all of a sudden trading deals all over the place without ever having done a second of compliance are the people that can rip you off and disappear. So as an investor, your due diligence on that sourcer helps you to make sure that this doesn't happen for you. It reduces the risk for you. So the third thing is 
anti-money laundering regis regulations. So as a sourcer, we legally have to be registered with HMRC for anti-money laundering, which means as a sourcer, I have to ask my investors for certain documentation to prove that the funds they're using to purchase a deal or the funds they're using to invest in a deal are legitimate funds from legitimate activity. They're not from criminal activity, right? So it's, as an investor, when you meet with or talk to a sourcer who pushes you and says that I need your ID, I need proof of address, proof of name, proof of date of birth, proof of where the funds have come from, proof of funds and where they've actually come from. You should be jumping for joy that you found a sourcer that actually is doing it right. Actually, so many investors push back to me and, you know, a lot of the students that I train really struggle with this um, because they meet investors and investors say, I'm not sending you my information. Why not? You know, it's all stored securely because the fourth thing is date protection, GPR. You know, we must be registered. I'll talk about that in a second. When you're working with a business partnership, why wouldn't you want to work with them properly? Why wouldn't you want your sourcing agent to be following what the law says they have to do to be good at what they do? It makes no sense to me. As an investor, you should be skipping around the room when you find a sourcer who actually does things right. So it's... Again, it's your responsibility to make sure you're asking these questions. So if you find, come across a sourcer who's got a great deal that looks amazing, that doesn't ask you for any information, just asks you for money really, really quickly, that should be a red flag. That should be you guys saying, well, actually, this doesn't sound right. These guys are not following the process. Now, everyone's process is slightly different, but the law defines that we have to have certain things done before we can sell a deal. So if they're not doing those things, that should be a worry for you. Regardless of how good the deal is, if the deal is coming from a really questionable source, is it really going to be a good deal? Maybe not. The fourth thing, I'm just going to have a sip of lemon sip. Lemon, it's rank. The fourth thing that you guys need to um, think about is data protection. So because your sourcing agent is going to ask you for your personal information, they're going to ask you for proof of funds, bank statements. They're going to ask you for proof of address, utility bills, passports, these sorts of things. You need to make sure that sourcing agent is registered with the information commissioner's office to hold that data in a, and, and that they're following the guidelines to hold it in a secure way. So data protection, when you register, they give you a code of conduct and you have to adhere to that code of conduct. OK, so that means about how you use your database, how you store people's information, how long you keep it for, whether it's relevant and so on and so forth. So every sourcer, in fact, pretty much every business has to be registered. If you've got a customer, you've got people's data, which means you have to be registered with the ICO. It costs £35 a year. Yes, it's a bit of a pain, but it's something that you have to do. And if you have to do it to be compliant, then why don't why aren't we doing it? You as the investor, the benefit to you is that if you just ask for, you, um, when you register with the ICO, you get like a membership number, a reference number. You can just ask to see evidence. You also get like a little certificate thing. You can ask to see evidence of their ICO or data protection reg registration. Again, this is just a way that you can start to differentiate the good from the bad. Because if you ask for an ICO reference number and they go, what's that? Probably they shouldn't be selling you a deal because it is one of like the first four things that you need to do before you set up as a sourcer. And if they're learning to be a sourcer and the person they're learning from hasn't taught them that, then I would question whether they're set up as a sourcer at all. So. These are four, first of all, four key things that you as an investor can ask your sourcing agent to make sure that they are a reputable sourcing agent and that they're doing things in the right way to actually benefit you and protect you. OK, so there's there's the first three things. As an aside to that, OK, it's important that you as the investor do your own due diligence on any deal. It's important that you see how that sourcer has actually broken down that deal, how they've come to the figures that they've come to. And by that, I mean, ask to see their financial analysis, ask to see the detailed breakdown of the deal. Now, as a sourcer, I can't think of any reason at all. I can't think of any. Maybe if there is anyone on here that doesn't share financial analysis, then let me know. But I can't think of any reason why anybody wouldn't share the full financial breakdown of a deal 
with any investor that was interested in a deal. I understand why you wouldn't want to say, um, why you wouldn't necessarily want to uh, share full address details, full um, photos for all of those sorts of things. Oh, I pressed something odd on my phone, on my laptop then. Um, I understand why you wouldn't want to share all of those sorts of things. But what I don't understand is why you wouldn't ever need want to share the full financials. Because when you share the full financials, what happens is the investor can see the full breakdown of how you've come to those numbers. Now, when you're making for you to source a deal onto somebody else, it has to be secured, right? For you to secure it, you have to have made an offer on it. For you to have made an offer on it, you have to have done the numbers. So you've got it there. It's information. Why wouldn't you share it? As an investor, the best way, one of the best ways to actually get to grips with whether a deal stacks or not is to ask to see the full financial breakdown. Again, if the sourcing agent won't share that with you or doesn't know the financials of a deal, I can tell you that every deal on my board, every single one of them, I know the inside and outs of the financials, whether they're my deal or I'm sharing the deal with a JV partner, I know them. Because without knowing them, how can you possibly sell it to somebody? It doesn't make any sense. So as an investor, what you can do, one of the tools that you've got is to just ask questions about the financials and understand how it's all broken down. And if they can't answer the questions, then they need to go back to the board and actually come back to you with the full information. So that's just another way that you can start to um, see through the people that are good and bad. Um, in terms of the due diligence that you do on a deal, I think this comes down to understanding the business strategy, the business model, revenue stream, whatever, that you actually are going to run. So if you're a rent to renter doing service accommodation, for example, then you really need to do some work in understanding how service accommodation works before you buy a deal. Because with service accommodation, for example, I see deals all the time coming through on email and it will say things like a gross rent in, or like a nightly stay is £120 a night, for example. £120 a night for 31 nights is gross income. Well, it isn't because you're not ever going to have 100% occupancy. So that can't be your forecasted income. You know, we've got deal, I see deals all the time that break even at like 85% occupancy. Well, if a deal breaks even at 85% occupancy, when are you ever going to make any money? Because you're not really likely to run it higher than about 90%. So you're going to lose money. With HMOs, for example, again, it's important that you understand how the numbers work how the offer's been made, how they came to that structure of the deal in the first place. And it's the same with development. If you've got a development that you're looking at and you're making an offer and you're planning to package this on or you're buying a development from a sourcer, that sourcer should be able to say to you, well, these are the build costs that we've factored in. These are professional service costs that we've factored in. This is a cost for utilities that we've factored in. These are the costs for demolition that we've factored in. These are the costs for um, contingencies that we've factored in. These are the costs for borrowing that we've factored in. And after all those different costs have been taken out, we've offered X, we've had it agreed at X, and that will make you X profit because of a GDV value of X, X, Y, and Z, let's say, three different figures. If your sourcing agent can't tell you the answers to those questions, then that deal is not done. They have not actually done the research. All they've done is offer a number, and then that's it. That, that's not ready to go for you. As an investor, you need to do the research and you need to make sure you're pushing back and asking good questions to understand whether or not people have actually done, gone to the effort of structuring the deal and securing it in the first place. So I think my voice is about to give out. So I feel like my little mini rant probably has given you as much information as I need to. Um, but I didn't know if anyone's got any specific questions, um, do you want to just fire them at me? We'll do a little quick kind of impromptu live Q&A. So let me have a quick look through here, see what questions we've got. Morning, Kaz. Morning, Phil. Morning, Nick. Wow, there's loads of you on this morning. Amazing. Hey, hey, hey. Morning, Stephen. Pippa, wow, lots of you. Morning, Arsh, Colleen, hello, hello, hello. Joel, Sekar, wow, excellent. Okay, so what questions have we got? Can a source of source anywhere in the UK? So Kudara, thanks for the question, great question. Um, the answer is yes. Actually, a sourcing agent can decide and choose to source anywhere they like. You could you could go um, outside of the UK if you wanted to. Um, 
the important that you know the the key thing about sourcing is you can source anywhere and um, i source on a national basis within my business and um, whether i should i started it like that it was quite painful at the start now i do it and it's fine um i think probably if i had my time again i might choose some um concise areas and focus on those but um you know i was learning and so, and i made mistakes um but yes ultimately a sourcer can source anywhere in the uk um, and an investor can buy a deal anywhere in the uk but the key things that change when you're looking at different parts of the uk are the comparables and the market so the demand changes the cost of um living changes the cost of utilities changes a little bit but not massively the cost of labor to do works changes changes the, the build costs change so when a sourcer is sourcing on a national basis as an investor buying a deal from that sourcer the, que the key questions are what costs have you factored in what running costs have you factored in where have you got your comparables for show me the evidence of the room rents that you're projecting show me the evidence of the nightly rates that you're projecting show me the gdv comparables and the, you know the resale valuations that you're showing it's important as an investor when you're buying a deal from a sourcer that you can they can answer all those questions for you and they can tell you where they've got that information so for us we either take screenshots of where we've got the information or we give you the link in the brochure for you to go and look at it yourself. Um, that's how we generally communicate in the best way so that an investor's got that full information. So could about hope that answers your question. Um, morning, Danielle. Nice little wave. Thank you very much. Morning, Jane. Morning, Kadir. How are you guys? So any other questions you guys want to fire at me? I'm kind of here for another, um, I was going to do this till about eight o'clock. So we've got a few more minutes. Um, if you guys wanted to um, chuck a question at me, then feel free. And you're welcome, Kudarat. I hope it helped. <coughs> the key thing with this, guys, is that actually it's, it's so important that you just take the time to look at the deals and that you, you don't jump into a deal so quickly i said i was going to come back to the financial thing so let me just touch on that before i go any sourcing agents that are asking for money to join their investor list who are asking for money up front before you've even seen details of a deal who are asking for big chunks of money like thousands of pounds before they'll arrange a viewing these sorts of sources, I would say, avoid at all costs because they're so focused on the money to start with that actually I question their integrity. Um, you know, that might be controversial to some, but that's my position on it. That's how I feel about it. Um, yes, I understand that as a sourcing agent, in some cases, it's good to get a financial commitment from an investor because it does help you to um, separate the tire kickers from the people that are serious. So by all means you know charge 150 250 pounds for a deal that's for a fee that's going to be five thousand pounds for a rent to rent for example then fine charge a, a refundable 250 pound to just really test the commitment of that investor if it's an investor that really wants the deal then they'll pay 250 quid and then they'll go and see it and if they don't want it you give it back to them fine i've got no issue with taking reservation fees holding fees no issue with that at all what I do have an issue with are sourcing agents who are charging, especially new investors who've got limited money anyway, because you're trying to get started in this business. You know, we, I remember three years ago, if someone had, um, you know, took, sold me a deal that lost me ultimately thousands, I'd have been screwed. So I, it's so frustrating for us and people like Justin, and because quite a lot of the time we're fixing problems of people that have bought deals from other sources who've made a load of money and then disappeared. So anybody who is trying to get you to pay money to sign up to their lists, just don't even entertain them. Don't even bother. Just delete the emails, unsubscribe from their emails. They are certainly never going to give you a level of service that you deserve. Um, there are so many other sources out there that deliver a better service than those sorts of people, so just don't bother. Um, and the second thing is, if people are asking for like two, three, four thousand pounds up front before you've been to a viewing, again, I would question why is that why do i need to commit that much money and also if you are going to commit that much money fine that's your choice make sure that the terms and conditions that you're signing up to absolutely release those funds if you decide not to move forward and doesn't 
state that those funds will be kept on account until they can find you another deal. I've got a client who put £4,000 in with a sourcing company. Um, they're, they're quite a well-known company. Their marketing is amazing. They managed to hit all the new investors coming in, and there's a lot of people that have put money in with them, put thousands of pounds in with these guys. And after they, they, they were floated a deal, they paid the money, then the viewing was cancelled and then the deal miraculously disappeared. 12 months later, as we sit here today, they still haven't had that money back and they've still not had another deal from that saucer. That source has basically just taken that money and is spending it and is making no effort whatsoever because his terms and conditions state that he can hold it on account until he finds another deal. And he's just saying he hasn't found another deal. And there's no time limit. There's no, and he's, um, you know, I, I haven't seen the terms and conditions, so I don't know exactly, but this, you know, this particular investor is really struggling now because they've lost an awful lot of money and it's actually stopping them from moving forward in the rest of their business. It's not fair. It's really, really not the way to work. So I wanted to follow up this video from Justin's video yesterday to just reinforce how important it is that this industry pushes back a little bit and stops putting up with people ripping off investors, people taking the piss out of you and not doing things in a proper way. So as an investor, understand, get educated in how this all works. And, um, you know, if you need if you want to know it, how you can actually do all of this, then just ping me a message. I can make sure that I send you details of how you can find this out. Um, you know, any questions at all, I'm available. Any questions at all, Justin's always available. Um, you know, just get in touch with us. Um, I'm going to disappear. I'm going to drink my lemon sip. Have an amazing day. Happy Friday. Um, those of you that are on here that are coming next week to the boot camp, I'm so excited to have you. It's going to be amazing. I've got loads of stuff planned for you, um, along with the guest speakers as well, which I'm very excited to have come and join us. Um, I'll see you guys next week. Those of you that are uh, on here and just kind of hanging out this weekend and have an amazing weekend, and I will catch you up with you guys next week. See you later, guys. Bye.